All right, I'll go ahead and get started, guys. Uh, thanks for joining. I'm actually going to go ahead and turn on my video. You know, we've been we've been doing Zooms for the last couple of weeks, and um, you know, it's it's a new normal, right? Where we've got video going, everyone's working from the house. Uh, we got the chat open. It looks like it's going. Um, if you guys do have uh, any questions, feel free to chat. If you can't hear anything, uh, I see we have one person saying that. Um, definitely check. Uh, I think we've got most people who can who can hear. Uh, from what I'm seeing. Um, but yeah, today's about uh, digital, digital disruption in retail. Um, you know, really it's been, uh, you know, as, as people have been saying, these strange times and really, really odd, uh, you know, kind of world that we live in right now. And it's, it's been interesting to kind of see all the different opinions out there on, you know, what's happening today versus what's happening tomorrow. And just really kind of seeing the, uh, the change in our industry has been interesting. So I want to share some of the stuff that we've seen from our customers some of the stuff we see in the industry in general, um, and then uh, hopefully provide some some insights. Uh, you know, we've got a Q and A at the end. If you guys want, uh, please feel free to to put some Q and A or some questions in there for the Q and A, uh, and we'll address it towards the end. So I am Travis Mary. I'm the CEO of FlexPoint. Um, we are a distributed order management platform, and uh, and we put this on today. So the agenda today is really talking about what we've seen, um, you know, from our customers on the uh, the inventory source side and our, our retailers and brands that we work with there. Um, really, kind of what we've learned as well, uh, really just from the, the the pandemic and just the reaction in the industry. Um, what are some of the takeaways there? Uh, we also want to give some somewhat of a what what you can do, what you can do today. Um, there's some there's a new normal we're going to talk about and some emerging themes of this that might pan out over a longer period of time, but we really do want to look at, you know, uh, what, what's actionable today. We're going to go into that new normal and what we think it might be, uh, and then the impact in the long term. And so if that impact uh, in the long term does play out, you know, how do you prepare for that tomorrow? And like I said, and, and you know, I posted this earlier today, but, you know, uh, give some fun here and uh, do a bold, biased, and, and unfounded predictions side of things. Just kind of talk about, you know, what could happen um, nothing really back in it, but just kind of, uh, you know, kind of just uh, messing around and seeing if anyone might agree or think it's the stupidest idea they ever heard. So the disclaimer is obviously we don't claim to have a crystal ball. Uh, we're just kind of taking in what we're seeing. Um, we are uh, going to make some predictions. You know, we're going to talk about uh, some of the things that we're seeing, and 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 hopefully we can you know have an open conversation about you know, what we might think is, is facts that we're seeing today versus what are some just more predictions. So the new normal, um, you know, I don't think anything we're going to talk about today is, is uh, what we're seeing today. Uh, as far as what we're expecting, everyone's going to be, you know, living in this, this bubble in their house, working uh, remotely. Uh, you know, I don't think that the new normal is what we're seeing today. I think it looks a lot more like we, we were living a couple weeks or a month or two ago. So, um, you know, I think a lot of what we're going to talk about today is, you know, what does that new normal look like? Um, how long is it going to take us to get there and, and just get a better idea of, um, you know, how can we adapt for, for that no matter how long it might take? What we are going to really kind of dig into is that, you know, even though we might not be in these, uh, in this kind of pandemic type environment for forever, what we do feel is we're going to see the acceleration of what we think is going to happen in the future, really, which is the, you know, the acceleration of this digital disruption that's already happening in the retail world. Um, you know, really, we've already seen retail uh, store closures just start to skyrocket in the last couple of years. You know, the U.S. alone, we saw just under 6,000 uh, two years ago. Uh, just last year, it almost doubled in 2019 of retail store closures. And they're already calling for potentially 15, depending on how long this pandemic goes on, um, you know, maybe even over 15,000 stores closing. At the same time, you know, retail spending online is increasing, um, you know, over, I believe it's over the last decades up like 153%. Uh, but with that said, it's still only 10% of online retail, uh, online sales are only 10% of overall retail. Um, so there's a lot of room to grow there, as we all know. Um, and it's definitely trending that way. We feel that you know, if anything, this, this new normal is anything, just progressing that notion and, uh, and accelerating this digital disruption. 
So what we've seen, you know, the short term pandemic behavior and strategies, what we've seen. So as many of you have probably been watching the news and, and kind of just seeing the, the behavior and, and, you know, being part of it yourself, uh, you can kind of see on this left hand side, you know, the lockdown economy where, you know, fitness and apparel and um, surprisingly enough, even fast food is kind of there's less spending there, obviously, in movie theaters and, and uh, airlines, um, you know, that has dropped significantly. Uh, from the the more spending side, right? The supermarkets, it's funny because it's it's right there in the middle where it's, uh, you know, people aren't buying, you know, there, there's, it's really kind of netting out, right? They, there was a, a push there for a little bit, but it looks like it's right, uh, you know, right in the positive by a couple percentage points. Um, general merchandise and e-commerce, I mean, Amazon is doing, you know, from the numbers that we've seen, Amazon is just, you know, doing a, a ton of business uh, each day where, I think uh, I read a report where it was four times a day is the average, I'm sorry, four times a week is the average amount of time that a U.S. Uh, citizen is actually visiting Amazon. Home improvement, interestingly enough, um, you know, that picture of the guy with the, the noodle hat, uh, you know, you can tell it was in Home Depot. A lot of people are going there. You know, you're outside, not much to do. You're improving your house, even though we're supposed to be social distancing. Um, you know, on uh, obviously video streaming, Food delivery, we've all heard about that. Alcohol is up and online grocery and gaming are by far the biggest outliers here. So, you know, gaming really picking up, you're at the house, nothing to do, might as well play a video game and get some food delivered uh, is what it looks like. Uh, just to kind of, you know, bring it home, obviously online groceries are really picked up. We're gonna talk a lot more about that and the trends we're seeing there. Um, <clears throat> and then obviously retail sales have plummeted with delivery services picking up kind of helping out and netting out to some extent uh, in, in, in what we've seen from restaurants and, and the fact that no one can actually go in and eat and buy a drink. At least we still got delivery services picking up their food and bringing up some revenue. And lastly here, uh, you know, eBooks, news media, streaming of uh, music and videos and gaming all obviously up. Uh, so really you can just, I want to show this. A lot of this is kind of obvious, but just show this shift that's happening. Um, you know, like I said earlier, we're not, saying that this is the new normal, that we're going to be in uh, gaming every day and uh, you know, not going to movie theaters and things like that. But if anything, it's accelerating this more distributed, more distant, more digital um, kind of environment that we're gonna live in, uh, even though if it might scale back eventually as you know, we, end the, we get to the end of this pandemic. So a couple of the lockdown slash pandemic strategies we've seen, um, you know, an interesting and a more bold and really risky one we've seen is uh, Calvin Klein and a couple others have uh, been reported of doing this, but the pack and hold retail strategy. So, um, you know, it's a buyer's market from what they're reporting out there for discount retailers. So the TJ Maxx's of the world who are buying, you know, last season's brand uh, line, uh, seasonal line or whatever it might be. Um, so Calvin Klein and a couple others are actually saying, we're not going to release any of our, <coughs> our line this year uh, or for this season. And we're going to keep it packed up in the warehouse and we're going to release it next year. Um, they're not really trying to publicize this too much, but it has been picked up by a couple of the e-commerce and retail blogs. Um, risky. It's not like wine. Apparel only gets, you know, loses value. Um, so it's an interesting strategy so they don't have to discount as much to those Ross and TJ Maxx's of the world. Um, so that's one interesting kind of bold strategy we've seen. You know, manufacturer pivots, obviously we've all kind of seen the alcohol manufacturers going to sanitizers. Everyone I feel like is selling masks. Um, you know, read an instant, interesting article on domestic sourcing. Uh, you know, U.S. spice market, uh, a large portion of that market is moving to uh, um, domestic sourcing. And, and a lot of them feel from what we've, what we've seen, you know, that they actually uh, feel that, you know, from their, from what they're saying, uh, that, that it might not go back to China as much as they, they were in the past. Garlic, I found, was actually one of the spices that's almost primarily sourced from China in the U.S., which is interesting. Um, so that, that was interesting to kind of see. One of my favorite ones, which I've, you know, kind of looked into this uh, for a while, and, and this is kind of a little bit new of a, newer of a concept when it comes to grocery, but dark stores. You might have heard of cloud kitchens or ghost kitchens, but dark stores really you know, where you're shutting down your store or you, you have inventory in a store where only employees are able to enter the store um, and then deliver and delivery contractors uh, to pick up and then deliver. Uh, you know, that's one where obviously it's a lot affected by the pandemic and social distancing, but there's a, there's a broader trend there that's already been happening, which, um, which we'll, be, we'll be talking about. 
So what we've learned from this is, you know, really, um, most businesses are not prepared for a pandemic, right? I mean, shocker. Uh, yeah, you really shouldn't be, right? I mean, it, it's not something that uh, any business is going to be prepared for. Um, you really shouldn't be spending too much time preparing for an, a, a pandemic. What you should be doing is, is installing good business practices, right? And what we're seeing is that those win out. Um, so if you think about it, diversi diversification in your supply chain and your sales channels are key here. That's really what's showing who's sinking and who's swimming uh, in the retail world right now. Um, you know, we have uh, on the inventory side of our, our business, um, inventory source being our, our director of suppliers um, that we're connected to and, and automate the retail uh, inventory and order management side of things. You know, we're seeing uh, suppliers shut down that cannot, can't accept orders, whether their warehouse is no longer able to um, fulfill in a timely fashion, given that their warehouse workers are out, or they have just seen an increase in orders because they are providing essential goods, whatever it might be, if you've got a single point of failure um, on the supply chain, then you're, you're going to be in trouble in, in these kinds of scenarios. Uh, but you're going to be in trouble a lot in, in business in general. That's, that's just a bad business practice to have a single point of failure on the supply chain. And the same goes with the, the channel side, right? And we've, we've seen the exact same thing happen. Um, you know, getting shut off from your supply chain is happening to a lot of our customers right now, especially in the, the, organ, uh, the grocery and the essential kind of janitorial equipment space, which is a, a large portion of what we, we integrate from a distributor side. But we're also seeing customers who have access to product and are ready to uh, distribute it, but getting shut off by companies like Amazon, which is no new uh, new thing, right? I mean, people hear about that all the time, getting shut down by Amazon. Amazon is telling a couple of our customers that they're, they have been reported as price gouging, which, you know, our customers are, are telling us that is not true. And they're just, you know, they feel that Amazon is once again, kind of not acting in their best interest and kind of taking more of a, um, you know, a selfish approach and, and kind of making sure that they fulfill on the goods that are, uh, are on the demand that they're seeing, right? That's all hearsay, obviously. Um, but you know, it's, it's a single point of failure where if all your business is built off Amazon sales, you're obviously not feeling uh, great right now in, in this time if you're no longer able to sell on Amazon. And then surprisingly enough, you know, but this, this third one uh, I think is worth mentioning, you, you need runway. We've seen, you know, not specifically our customers, we've seen a couple customers, you know, kind of pause things, uh, kind of slow it down and kind of try to wait things out. But just in general, seeing the amount of um, companies on, on the news or wherever it might be uh, going out of business really in the first 30 to, to 45 days, um, you know, the, the good business practice of having runway, not only just when you're getting started, but, um, you know, in, in, at any given time is, is another thing that's going to really help you get through this pandemic. So one of my favorite parts of, of this whole presentation is the new normal, right? And obviously speculating in some of this, but kind of looking at some of the trends that we just talked about and, and uh, talking about the, the themes that we see emerging. So I think the number one clear uh, theme that we're seeing is the future of X is accelerated, right? And so the future of work where people are distributed, working via Zoom, you know, on cloud technology, I think, you know, that is obviously a foregone conclusion of a more efficient model, um, you know, from, you know, from cloud and just having a distributed workforce and things like that. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, barriers to, to making that work and making it work as efficiently as you currently do. And I think this is accelerating that. And it's interesting to see, you know, the future of work really be pushed along. Healthcare, same thing, right? The teledoctor uh, approach has been around for a while, but it's really not mainstream. You're seeing more and more people get introduced to that. Um, and then fitness, you know, fitness, whether it's a Peloton or whether it's, you know, these, these new, I think this one's the mirror, uh, these new apps and, and physical devices out here for your home are really progressing the future of work, healthcare, fitness. Um, you know, I don't have retail here because, you know, I'll talk about it in a sec, but basically any industry uh, where, you know, a digital medium can make sense to, to, to transact uh, is, is being accelerated in that direction. And that has a huge impact on retail. And just a real quick Google trend uh, to kind of drive this point home, Google trend analysis, right? So Zoom, you can see in blue, Zoom etiquette, which is not a, a very popular keyword uh, to search or keyword phrase, right? Uh, among phone etiquette, business etiquette, and obviously wedding etiquette, you can see the spike there. So just that's kind of showing that, similar to the graph earlier, showing the, the difference in 
you know, gaming versus going to movie theaters. This is just showing this, this push that's happening. I'm sure it's going to come back, right? And there's obviously it's not going to outlast wedding etiquette because no one knows what to do at a wedding. You know, um, where do you sit? When do you eat? Whatever it might be. So I'm sure wedding etiquette is going to be, um, you know, a much higher of an uptick here in the next couple of hopefully months or at least by in the next year. Um, but it's showing that push, that, that disruption that's happening and really accelerating, you know, getting more towards this more digital interaction environment that we live in. So I thought that was an interesting graph. And how that affects retail, uh, really, I mean, that's, if you're going to expect your doctor to, to jump online with you, your, uh, your coworkers, uh, your, your fitness buddies, um, you're going to want retail to, to do the same, right? You're going to expect what we're already starting to see glimpse it up, glimpses of where it's online, kind of dressing room and showroom type approach um, where you're trying on clothes in a virtual way. Uh, you're going to start having, you know, AKA Zoom, like Zoom meetings, I guess, or whatever they're going to call them. Uh, through the through the live chat on your retail e-commerce stores, um, you know live chat in general. Before we talk about video chat and voice mixed with uh, text and, and all of that, um, it's already showing that you know their consumers are more likely to buy from it. That they're more likely to return. You know, there's been a ton of studies around live chat and e-commerce that you know this is only the natural progression uh, where. Uh, the more that you're online shopping on, a, on an e-commerce store and now able to interact with a, a sales consultant or someone you would typically in a store that can provide you advice, it's really going to slowly start uh, putting more and more pressure on the brick and mortar um, retailers to, to, to add more value than what that is today, which a lot of it is that face-to-face -face interaction and discussion around the product. Um, so, you know, that's one piece of the future of every industry going more digital um, is that retail will have to as well. But I also think, and I'll talk about it more towards the end of this, that uh, with more digital interactions, I think the channels of where you're buying products are obviously going to evolve. So number two, the emerging theme, I think we all know, uh, probably been part of it, is the local delivery going mainstream. Um, so this is a, a chart that uh, I got earlier today showing the daily downloads of these grocery apps. Um, you know, there, there's no doubt that more and more people, given this current situation, are, are ordering online, um, grocery especially. Uh, once again, I'm sure that we're going to pull back. People are going to start going back to the grocery store. But what does this do from changing our behavior and getting us more comfortable with this approach? So one of my, my favorite themes that I've just I've tracked for the last couple months, maybe a year plus, is the idea of micro-fulfillment, dark stores, ghost kitchens or cloud kitchens. Um, you know, I really do think they're going to gain traction with this. Uh, not that we're, we're going to stop going to Publix and uh, wherever you might go, but, you know, it, it's really uh, with an uptick in delivery, um, you know, ghost kitchens are essentially with the rise of Uber Eats and Grubhub and all those are, they're uh, a place where just you have your cooks and you've got your delivery workers and there's no actual seats. No one's coming in and sitting down. And in really in a micro fulfillment sense, you're just kind of churning through a conveyor belt of to go orders. Right. And so, you know, the micro fulfillment side not only works for food, but could work for other industries as well, where you have your normal pickup in store uh, brick and mortar, but then you also have your micro fulfillment warehouse, you know, attached or part of your larger online warehouse. Um, so, you know, I think one of the emerging themes from this is that as we see an uptick, in uh, grocery delivery and local delivery in general is micro fulfillment and these different kinds of uh, you know cloud or dark stores. Interesting to see, right? Food makes a lot of sense, but you know how many times do you go back to Home Depot for one project? Right? I know I'm probably three, four times in a day. Maybe five might be my max. I'm not proud of that one, but uh, you know there's there's no doubt that. Uh, there, that's one of those that you could see where if you had quick, cheap, maybe even free local delivery um, from Home Depot and you could just, while you're sitting there putting in the back deck or, you know, fixing the door or whatever it might be, um, laying floor, if you can just order something and keep working and have that delivered for in a cost-effective manner, there's no doubt that, that that's going to happen, right? And, and making it cost-effective might seem like a, an impossible feat, but, you know, saying that you had two-day free shipping, you know, 10 years ago, sound pretty crazy as well. Um, and then, you know, just seeing the rise of specialized slash secure delivery services, right? So, you know, do we look to, uh, you don't want an Uber each driver picking up, uh, you know, I don't even know about the legalities around all this, to be honest, uh, picking up uh, prescriptions and things like that. But is there, you know, 
something there that we have more specialized delivery services of things like um, pharmaceuticals and things like that. And then that, this third one really is it's, it's the best way to put it, it's about time to set up that website. Um, a lot of small businesses have kind of held out. Um, you can see here on the, on the right, um, you know, that just don't have an e-commerce presence, right? 74% um, from Small Business Trends is reporting that 74% don't have an e-commerce store. Uh, 42, even more shockingly, feel the web's not important. Um, and 20%, 28% no site at all, right? Not even just a website. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of small business out there. You might feel like every business has a website, but it's, it's really not the case. Uh, and definitely not the case to have an e-commerce enabled. Um, so as we all know in the left hand graph right here with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we're seeing stores get shut down. You can see uh, drop 90%. Obviously a lot of these states are, are issuing a mandatory shutdown. So um, I think it's about time to start working on it. And we've been seeing that, you know, anecdotally, we've been seeing customers come to us and say, you know, I, I want to get a, a store set up. Um, you know, they were just an Amazon seller and they did their brick and mortar or, uh, they didn't have anything and they're just coming to us for the first time. We've actually have seen an uptick in our turnkey websites. So we do a turnkey Shopify store where we'll, you know, get it set up really quickly for you and load products into it and, and kind of hand it over to you to kind of customize from there. We definitely have seen an uptick there. Um, and so, you know, that's, it, it's been interesting to kind of see. So a lot of times, uh, or a lot of what we've heard as well is it's time to kind of work on it. You've got, you know, less to do from a day-to-day -day operations perspective in store. So it's, it's about time to work on that website. And it's too early to tell you, I couldn't get any numbers on that, on how many people are doing that. Uh, but, you know, we are seeing a lot of this. And this is just from my Instagram feed. Um, I, I am seeing this from a couple different uh, local businesses I follow where, you know, they're opening up and uh, <clears throat> starting to sell, you know, whether it's beer or, you know, you know their own uh, you know, food or whatever it might be, local uh, you know, donut shops, stuff like that. Um, setting up a, a store, making it e-commerce enabled, and then, you know, either locally working with uh, – a delivery service or just having their, their members, their, their team members go and deliver it. So I think those three themes, it's, it's pretty interesting to kind of think about what does that mean? You know, if those kind of come to fruition, they feel like, you know, it's, it's something that it might scale back after we get past this, but not really go away and definitely pick up steam as we go. So what does that mean when, it, when we talk about having more time spent in digital communication? Um, you know, on a Peloton, interacting in a lot of cases live or with other groups, um, you know, through a digital medium, you know, something that's really just for me been introduced in the last couple of months. Um, and it's, it's, it feels like you're, you're part of a kind of a future, uh, futuristic kind of, you know, movement and, and working and, and socializing more from a digital medium. So what happens when we start doing that more? Uh, but then also, you know, with more products being digitally cataloged, we just saw Green Room had never put uh, their, you know, growlers and crawlers and cases up on um, up on a website. So they never had probably tracked it properly, never had it, you know, the images and the, the pricing down. They never had it cataloged in a way that they could sell it online. More and more businesses are doing that. They're digitally cataloging their, their product and getting it up so it's e-commerce enabled, right? So we got more of that picking up. And then now on top of that, we're seeing a surge in local delivery and this infrastructure being built out uh, as micro fulfillment picks up. And you know, that it's very much a thing before this pandemic, it'll be very much a thing after. Um, so now we've got people spending time online, products going online and being digitally cataloged and now a local delivery network. Like what, what can happen from that is I think there's a lot of different possibilities, but I'll tell you one thing, it's going to get complex. It's going to get really complex for retailers. Um, you know, it's not the, the traditional, I've got a warehouse, I bring in goods to my warehouse, I sell it through my brick and mortar, or I sell it online in my store. It's going to be a lot more of, you know, data management, a lot more of supply chain diversity, uh, new channels uh, showing up, right? So just to kind of start here on this left-hand side, if you've ever seen any of my presentations, um, you know, you know, I had to get this graph in where, or this, this uh, diagram where we kind of show the supply side here on the left where, you got your brick and mortar. Most likely you're going to get uh, an order um, that's going to be fulfilled by one of these ways, right? Your brick and mortar is going to be a pickup in store. Um, you might have uh, inventory in your warehouse that you're shipping uh, online, shipped to the, the actual, res actual residential door. And then now, you know, uh, a micro fulfillment uh, warehouse as well, where it's, it's optimized to deliver locally. 
Um, that's obviously going to be, you know, the more sophisticated retailers, but you know, that's going to be kind of table stakes for that, that top 1% retailer. And then from the uh, channel side, we we got the traditional online store platforms where you're selling your web, on your website, you know, via Shopify or big commerce, where it might be. You're selling via a third party marketplace, traditionally like Amazon or eBay. But now, you know, I really do think about what, what is, what does it look like um, if we start, if Home Depot starts uh, offering local delivery and things like that, um, you know, are you as a small retailer uh, going to offer local delivery too? Uh, are you going to be part of Ships Network? Is there going to be a new local delivery marketplace um, outside of just grocery, right? And are you prepared for that? And then in-app purchases, right? Uh, we'll talk a little more about it, but, you know, are, are, is your data structured and do you have the ability to facilitate what we already see in Instagram where you can upload a catalog to Instagram and have shoppable posts, but you know, does Peloton do other, you know, uh, workout apps or these new group apps that are showing up as house party app, um, you know, that people are using, does there, is there, uh, you know, traction in there where you're selling physical goods there? Um, now that we know where everyone's at from, you know, geo, uh, lo location and you've got a local delivery network. So, I think it's pretty interesting. Either way, we, we know it's going to be a lot more complex here in the near future. So that's obviously down the road. Um, let's talk about the impact, you know, what you can do today and how to prepare for tomorrow. So today is get e-commerce enabled. You saw that post, even if a brewery, a local brewery can do it, where I'm pretty sure the guy serves 90% of his day, um, anyone can do it. Go and get a Shopify store or a big commerce store is what we recommend. Those are two that we see are very easy to get set up. SaaS platforms um, up and running if you don't have a store. I think most people joined the webinar today probably have a store, but it's worth saying go get a store set up. It takes, you know, a week to two weeks at the most to get it fully configured. You know, use ShipStation as one of those for quick label printing um, and do it yourself, at least for the first two weeks. You know, uh, try to force yourself to learn how to use these tools at least at a – at a high level um and then you know bring in someone if you need to after the first two weeks of trying to get it set up it you know if you can uh revisit your site messaging so like i said most of you probably have a website already up revisit your messaging can you proactively answer the current fears that we're seeing um you know people are feeling that things might be out of stock um you know the ship times might be delayed uh, origin of items uh, you know where is this coming from right i mean that's already kind of an issue you buy something on instagram you know, even I've been, you know, we know a lot about the AliExpress and, uh, you know, getting, buying something and not realizing it's coming from China. It's not going to be here for 45 days. And, you know, I've, I've fallen victim to that, um, where, you know, origin items is already an issue, but obviously a lot more now, right? So can you answer those and are you industry where you need to be upfront about that? Um, <clears throat> rotating your products, right? Based on the situation, that's an obvious one. Shuffling promotions, you know, really look at that though. Some, it might have kind of fall by the wayside to, to think about that, but definitely look at that. And then start offering Zoom consultations. So it kind of goes into that, the future of work and future of healthcare. The future of retail is more rich medium online. Um, can you start offering, you know, more of that rich medium and, and interaction? So that's the next, the next bullet as well, where if you don't have live chat, set it up. Uh, you you want to get people... You know, they're on your website more often than, than now than they were. Uh, you know, more people are shopping online in general, <laughs> even if you just have a online store, uh, but even more so if you had a brick and mortar and an online store, right? And your traditional shopper is now going online. So set up online chat. There's free options and cheap options in Olark and live chat. Um, I would look at uh, your app store, right? So Shopify and BigCommerce both have an app store. Find the top rated free, cheap option. And set it up. It should take a minute or two. <clears throat> With that, you, you know, it might not be easy to do right out of the gate. You might not sound like it's easy to start doing live video consultations uh, via your website, but it's very much doable. You could set up a live chat at, and then as you're talking, offer up a, a Zoom uh, meeting, right? Let me talk you through. You know what? You're not sure how, how large, you know, is that, is that shirt, uh, you know, bigger than most, or how does it fit, or whatever it might be. Um, you know, is that in good condition? Whatever it might be, you can literally start a Zoom chat. You can, um, you know, walk them through a product that you've got. If you're in your store by yourself, right, and you're kind of taking that approach, you can even show the products off. Um, if you're in your warehouse, whatever it might be, I think it's worth trying, um, worth kind of preparing for the, the tomorrow where this is more of a requirement and something you could really start doing now and testing. 
Um, and it's as easy enough as just saying, would you like to jump on a quick Zoom chat? I'll, I'll share a link with you and we can, I can show you exactly what the product looks like. And then lastly, you know, as ad spend is, uh, is an interesting topic, um, or how do you spend money on ads right now? And, and each business is going to be very different, but I think it's worth looking at one geographically is the kind of the low hanging fruit. What, where, since the, the, really the pandemic has, has pushed and, and really monitoring it in general and seeing where has your traffic dropped, picked up, where has conversions increased or decreased? Um, this is the time where geography can matter a lot for your business more so than if it didn't in the past. Uh, and you can really start looking at reallocating ad spend to certain geographies that are performing well right now versus other ones that might have performed, you know, well in the past, but are not. So, you know, I think for some of the more savvy retailers, they probably realize that, but uh, I think that might be helpful to, you know, if you hadn't thought about that yet to really dig into the geographical trends and re reallocate ad spend based on increasing conversions based on the, the current environment we're in. And you'll have to look at that, I think, week by week. So how to prepare for tomorrow. So tomorrow is, you know, really here on the left, it's the shoppable app, you know, the shoppable post, which Instagram is really one of the first to do this, but there's others out there as well. It's someone buying through, you know, the physical world that's now being merged with the digital. Uh, I think commerce is the only, you know, the next logical uh, step for a lot of these, whether it's you know, buying something through, you know, a fitness app or whatever it might be. And then, you know, with this local delivery network where everyone is, is more or less, you know, interacting in games and already doing kind of in-app purchases there, you know, how does the physical world kind of meld together with the, the digital? And uh, I think local delivery and, and understanding, you know, where the local uh, users are is, is going to be a piece of that too. So with that, let's just kind of look back at this diagram. Just let's remember that it's really kind of this uh, this, this quagmire of, um, you know, integrations and connections. Um, you know, that's what you really, you're, you're probably looking at here uh, in the future if you're not already there, right? So the top 1% retailers are already kind of prepping for this, if not already prepared for it. Um, but I think it's going to expand more into the smaller and mid-sized uh, retailers. So with that in mind, here's a kind of, kind of a high level checklist. So the first thing you need to do, <clears throat> just like our local brewery here, you need to get inventory and product data centrally managed. Um, not only just digitized in a catalog, but centrally managed where you know that you're going to have these new avenues for sales, these new sales channels. You're going to have new supply chain options, which there will be micro fulfillment, you know, third party micro fulfillment warehouses that you won't have to set up your own. You'll just put your products there and they'll take care of that. So you think of yourself as that central going back here. You're, you're that central kind of those two cogs right there. Um, you know, as you know, your data is, is what's important now. And you're going to be getting asked for data from any of your partners, whether it's supply chain partners or distribution channel partners. So get it centrally managed in one spot and, and know that you're going to need to modify that based on the channel or the uh, supply source that you're going to be working with, right? Pricing, uh, pricing data, you know, the actual data, whether it's imagery or categorization, um, know that, you know, you're going to have a central uh, repository of this data and your inventory, uh, but make sure you're flexible enough to kind of work with other channels. Uh, provide an automated export or API of warehouse inventory. So, uh, you know, obviously, <clears throat> as you work with more trading partners in this world, you're going to be asked for data. Um, you're going to be asked for, you know, how much do you have in stock in your warehouse? You're going to be asked, how much do you have in stock in your third party warehouse that you don't own, right? So, how do you get access to that data? Um, you're going to be asked uh, this, this third one, or this third bullet how do I place orders with you? Right. And it's Grubhub or, you know, it's the next version of that, that now wants to come into your industry and wants to place orders with you. And they want to place, you know, five a second, um, you know, or, you know, 10 a minute or whatever it might be. And you're, you're going to, you're not going to tell them go to my Shopify store and place an order. Right. So you need to have a way to accept orders um, in an automated fashion. You need to pick a platform that has an open API or has connection with these channels that you're going to be targeting. Uh, and that automatically integrates into your order management system. So you don't have to, you know, do anything manual from that side because the other option is Grubhub or, you know, the next channel, big channel or, uh, whatever it might be is going to ask you, okay, I can't automatically integrate with you. Well, then you're going to need to just manually accept these orders and manually update tracking and manually do a ton of stuff. So, um, keep that in mind uh, on how you evolve. If you know that you're not currently doing anything in an automated fashion today. And then, uh, I kind of talked about assume the multi-channel fees and the differing fulfillment requirements are going to happen. 
Um, so make sure you've got that centrally managed system, but also are flexible enough to work with your, your partners. And then the big thing, going back to the earlier slides, diversify your supply chain. Um, if you don't drop ship today and you, you have warehouse inventory, um, be prepared to drop ship. It is a, it is a growing supply chain fulfillment um, method and, uh, and a supply chain need from larger retailers, right? Macy's 100% of what they do online is, is drop shipped. Uh, and that's like an old school department store, right? Uh, there's really there's really a push here as more and more uh, digital sales are happening, less need for people to actually purchase via brick and mortar, as we're seeing today. There's less need to store that inventory in um, the actual end retailer. So, you know, being asked to drop ship is only going to increase. So if you are uh, a, uh, a brand or a wholesaler that stores inventory and or a retailer, really, uh, mostly a brand or a wholesaler, be sure you can drop ship because you will be asked by someone you're going to want to work with. And if you're a retailer and you're not drop, drop shipping today, you're going to want to look at it because, you know, as you expand more into uh, different channels and need, needing to compete, um, we've got a whole nother presentation on this, but you know, offering a catalog and offering the size, the color, the item that your customers want, uh, it, it's just table stakes now in the, in the era of Amazon. All right, now we'll get to the fun part. Um, some bold, biased, and unfounded predictions. Um, so the first one here, you know, this one's not too bold and not too crazy, but, you know, as even though a good portion of America and across the world really is going to go back to uh, working in offices at some point, uh, more companies will be offering work from home. I think that, uh, that's a fair assessment of, of what might happen in the future. Uh, even companies that said work from home would never – happen. Uh, it's not for us. I think you're going to be more open to it. Um, I heard that, you know, someone else mentioned that I kind of stole that one, but I think that makes a lot of sense. That really resonates. Um, what I kind of, you know, in my biased way kind of thought, well, that's probably gonna lead to more online shopping. Right. And so I, I, if you're at the office and you're working versus you're working at your desk in your, in your own house, I think, uh, going and stopping and buying something online is going to happen more and more. So I think that's only going to accelerate the online shopping world. Um, but then kind of even more kind of out there, I don't know, it's probably going to be slowed. The only way it would be slowed is if we saw more of that computer mining software. As more, more people go work from their house. Uh, companies are worried about them not doing their job or not, you know, staying focused. We may see computer monitoring software coming back um, and really tracking time or tracking browser uh, interactions or, you know, websites you can visit, whatever it might be. Obviously, you can still shop on your phone and that's still going to happen, but um, you know, it'll be interesting to see as we go more towards a work from home kind of model for a lot of companies, um, you know, do we bring back more of that computer monitoring software, uh, even in this age of privacy and things like that? It'll be interesting to kind of see how that pans out. Uh, number two, so a surge in government backed pandemic prep, uh, prepared or prepped, uh, warehouses. Um, and then also government backed warehouse robotics grants. So that second one might be happening today, probably is already happening today. Um, but the idea here is that, you know, being prepared for this again in the future to make sure that global e-commerce, at least national e-commerce does not get shut down, right? Amazon is under fire. They've been, they've really kind of done a great job of like delivering on, you know, the demand that they've seen, but I think they just had their first death. Uh, and I don't know the details on that. Um, so don't quote me, but what I did read was they did have their first death. They've had, you know, dozens of cases. Um, they're under fire for a lot of stuff like they always are. Uh, but, you know, I think there's probably an opportunity for someone in, uh, you know, to make a name for themselves in the government to really push for this. And I'm sure there's going to be lobbying uh, for it as well from, you know, from our industry. But I I'd be interested to see if that happens. Who knows? Might not be a thing. Might already be a thing. I, I don't know. So the new wave of location-based marketplaces. So I kind of touched on this earlier, but, you know, an Uber Eats meets uh, Groupon, right? Uh, local delivery for more than just food. Um, I, you know, I don't know, there's not a ton of industries. I gave that Home Depot example. Um, when you've got Amazon with two day shipping, now one day shipping, how, how important is that? I think that's one of those things where you just have to keep on watching. Is there, is there value in, you know, local small brands who might not be in an Amazon warehouse uh, being shipped to your door uh, very quickly in a local fashion? Um, do you need something in 10 minutes or 20, you know, let's say half an hour or that same day that Amazon isn't really prepared to do. Um, is there more of a local search across a network of, of, uh, 
you know, small brick and mortars. I mean, every, every brick and mortar is on a, on a POS system now that if they're tracking inventory properly, can be connected to a, a marketplace. Um, it'll be interesting to see. Who knows? Maybe not. Maybe it is a thing. This one's kind of long, but it's, it's kind of what I was talking about, really. The next generation of social media being more of that physical and digital interaction, which, you know, I think we're already seeing. Um, but then also the in-app purchases being accelerated, right? Whether it's, you know, a diet bet or a challenge group, right? You're seeing more and more apps gain traction there where people are looking to kind of interact with each other and, and do it in a structured fashion, whether it's like a challenge or, a, like I said, a diet bet. Um, group workouts, you know, I've seen my, my wife are do, is doing those. I've, I've never even heard of those until this past week, um, you know, via uh, uh, whether it's Zoom. My, my mom's doing them via Zoom. Uh, my wife's doing them uh, on the Peloton. So it's interesting to see. I feel like, you know, kind of selfishly, the logical next step of that is, uh, all right, you just finished your, your Peloton ride. Here's a smoothie, right, or a discount for a smoothie from your local Smoothie King, and it's delivered to your door by the time you're done with the ride. Um, once again, I don't know. I, I could see that happening. I could see that taking a while. I could see a lot of things breaking down in, in between. Um, but I think it's interesting to kind of to think about. And then lastly, because everyone's got to get blockchain in when you're talking about the future, um, blockchain introduced to, co to confirm the original uh, or the origin is what I meant to write there of physical goods, right? So uh, when I was looking into this, the, the U.S. domestic sourcing side of, of the pandemic and how that's been affecting different industries, like I said, I ran into the spice industry and, uh, you know, seed the shelf was brought up uh, a couple of times where that being important. And I can see that a lot with consumable products, right, and, and grocery um, but even just in other products, in my example earlier, where I didn't actually know where it originated from when I bought it, um, who, who was selling it, who was the original person who sold it. If, if it's not a, a brand uh, that you know, and even when they are brands, right? Amazon faces that issue all the time on counterfeits and things like that. So, you know, blockchain or something uh, in the future, really taking, um, you know, a, a stance on showing the origin of an actual physical product and us being able to prove where it's coming from. Seed to shelf. <clears throat> all right, that is that is it. That's uh, all my predictions, all the insights that we've we've had from our uh, and gained from our customers, and just kind of the the research we've done on our side. So, um, with that, if you do have any questions, I'm going to open it up uh, in the Q and A. Looks like there's a Q and A section and the chat section. <clears throat> all right. Uh, just some overall comments here, which is pretty cool. I haven't had a chance to check them. Um, what do you think about regional grocery distribution since, since drop shipping is really hard for supply chains and grocery? Like, yeah, um, regional. I, so I, I'm not really sure what the question is specifically around regional grocery distribution. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's probably an uptick in that, right? I mean, I think that's what companies like UNFI uh, trying to drop ship and, and things like that are, are trying to accomplish. Uh, but yeah, you know, you're kind of taking it not just micro local uh, distribution and, and last mile delivery, but, you know, really kind of focusing on distributing grocery and, uh, and, and just regions. You know, I don't know too much about the space to be able to comment on that, how much of that's happening today already, but, um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, someone's asking if I can repeat again what I said about local POS to track supply. So I just, you know, it, it's kind of interesting to think as we integrate more and more POS systems, which we've been doing. Um, you know, that's data of local inventory in a local brick and mortar um, down the road. And, and they're, they're tracking it. They're digitizing their catalog, right? Like I was talking about earlier. And now we see, here's a great example. Um, and it's already kind of happening with some apps, but, you know, Green Room Brewing just came on with and started actually putting inventory up so they know that they can take online sales. So if they are already tracking these in their POS or whatever they're doing, uh, you know, there's there's no nothing stopping me to, to ask a a, uh, um, a brick and mortar to, you know, allow me to connect via API into their POS system and just take the top four and say, it's nothing on you to do. You don't have to upload anything. I just want to sell your stuff locally through my new app. That's a local beer delivery app. And I just need to connect to your Clover POS system. Uh, so that was my point there is that it's not too hard uh, to do that. Uh, it's really just takes, is that a viable business model in general, right? I mean, I think the technology part is simple. Do you have enough people putting in accurate inventory in there? Do you have a demand for that? Um, and is it viable uh, past what, you know, like I said, there's a lot of apps already doing it already. Um, 
appreciate the, the nice words there. I uh, get a recording. Yep, I'm definitely sending a recording to to everyone uh, that was here. Um, service provider. Yeah, service providers are a little bit tougher, uh, right? Um, you know, I think it goes back to, you know, this question is I'm a service provider uh, of a sign shop. What do you think? Uh, you know, I think service is tough in a time where we're social distancing. Um, but you can still, like I said, as mediums like Zoom and things like that and uh, become richer in that you can you can talk through uh, and have a face-to-face -face interaction to some extent on a Zoom meeting and, and, and show and kind of instruct. Um, I think that you got to look to leverage what you have. Um, and get creative. I don't have much uh, knowledge in the service industry, but I would say that looking and leveraging new technologies is going to be your best bet. Uh, what kind of closures have we seen? So we've seen a good bit of uh, closing of, of warehouses that really just can't keep up with the volume. So it's kind of interesting. We've, we've seen it on both sides where obviously a couple of the grocery uh, distributors we work with are, are not accepting orders currently because they just have such high volume. Uh, we've heard of some actually, and they're running out of stock and the supply chains broke down um, <clears throat> because uh, if you're sourcing outside of, you know, the nation, it's tough to get in products right now. Uh, so we've seen that happen. Uh, we've also seen just really mass delays and other items that aren't really essential. Like firearms is a big industry that we, we track. And, um, you know, there's been a huge increase in that. Anytime something like this happens, you know, the firearm industry really spikes. Um, so there's delays there, but they have less of a uh, supply chain issue, which is interesting to see. Uh, obviously, grocery, it, there's going to be supply chain constraints there, just given like frozen goods and perishable items. Um, but it's, it's interesting to see, you know, even firearms, which has not, not as much of a supply chain issue. They just, you know, workers being out sick or social distancing, uh, slowing down warehouse, um, just movement uh, has been interesting to kind of see. All righty. Um, there came through. So I'm here on chat and I'm trying to get to this Q and A showing as on red. Uh, I don't know, Melanie, if you're on there uh, and able to see the Q and A, you know, usually we do this. We've got, we've got the whole team kind of working it together. It's been different um, all being distributed. Let me see if I stop sharing. It might help. I'll pause. <coughs> Yeah, that's um, that's everything I got. If I missed your, I'm trying to. I feel like there should be a Q and A section here that I'm just not seeing. Let's stop sharing all together. All right. Well, it's not letting me open the Q and A right now, guys. So sorry if uh, if I missed a question. Um, yep, that's it. Uh, oh, well, we got a couple more coming through the chat at least. Yeah, if you can't, I would just go through the chat uh, if you can't get one in through the Q&A because it's not opening up like the chat is on my side. Okay, but yeah, it's coming through the chat. I've got a couple new ones came through. Um, we've got seven minutes left. Might as well kind of hit some of these. So how as a retailer can I prevent oversells via allocating inventory for drop shipping? And how do you manage low inventory thresh thresholds when multiple people are connected to the same feed during a high volume flash sale? So that's, that's a great question. That, that teed me up. Um, I, I do recognize the name, I think, uh, and, and I, I think this person might be in the space. So um, I appreciate that, that softball kind of. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, as a retailer, how you prevent oversells, right? So you're talking about pooled inventory as you drop ship um, that you don't have right? A record of truth in your own system of at any given time, you'd be selling the same, you know, Yeti cup as the next person. Uh, and they could go on a large sale real quick. And, and, you know, the other retailer takes all the last 12 Yeti cups that are left. You still show 12 in your order manager system because, um, you didn't sell any, right. But they're all gone. So, you know, it's really about choosing the record of truth and the timing of that inventory data. So we obviously, you're going to be pulling in inventory of how many of these are in stock when you're drop shipping it from a supplier. You're going to see 12. That supplier you're relying on is to be providing an updated inventory feed where 
they should be at least, you know, we've got some distributors that will do it every five minutes, more commonly every hour. It can be tough during the flash sale kind of scenario if it's only every hour. Uh, but in general, you're going to ask of your distributor to provide some kind of feed. Ideally, you're connecting via API. And it's, it's real time as possible. Um, but you're going to rely on that. And, that. and it's really about your partners there. Uh, with that said, you can do some things to kind of prevent it, right? You can you can pull the feed as often as they update it and have an optimized sync like we like we do with inventory source and flex point. And every time it changes and you get that, you're going to automatically push that. That's one. Number two, the quantity. Uh, if it gets low, you can set a quantity filter. So if anything drops below, you know you know it's going to be a flash sale, and you put it something uh, super high like 40, or it's just a, a normal day. You set it something low at like five. You can automatically mark it out of stock to prevent stockouts. And then lastly, you can have, and I believe there's a couple of different software uh, companies out here that do this. I think, um, yeah, so there's a couple of different software companies out there that do this, uh, committed stock, right? So it's pooled inventory, yes, but say it's not pooled by a ton of retailers, you're one of five, your order is gonna matter a, a ton, or at least somewhat in that. So you can add that as another layer where, sure, you didn't sell, um, you know, you sold maybe five of those and your other competitor uh, sold seven of the same that they had access to from that distributor. At least you can bring yours down five for the time being. Um, and then it maybe hits like a threshold to drop it to nothing because you set like a low quantity stock threshold. Um, so that committed stock and the idea that also tracking in inventory and mixing that in with just as often as you can updating of inventory from the supplier is really the only thing you can do. But like I said, you rely a lot on your supplier to provide good data there. I really can't, I wish I could talk on blockchain and smart contracts as social, social distancing increases. Uh, I'm, I'm not even gonna try to touch that, sorry, Joe. It's just, I don't know enough there. Um, I just, yeah, so, you know, this is kind of, Charlie writes here, um, just opened a Shopify store, uh, built mostly around dropship. But right, obviously, as I mentioned, a lot of these suppliers are on hold and not taking orders, which happens to be the case here. Um, would you recommend building out inventory? Um, you know, I think having a distributed, it goes back to diversifying the supply chain. Yes, I, I do think that, I, I, you know, I'm a proponent of dropship and the model. Um, I think it goes really well with the traditional wholesale model as well. And I think having both of those is really what you see the top 1% retailers doing and, and, and puts a good example out there. Um, you know, dropship is a great way to identify products that you want to buy wholesale and make more margin on and bring in house um, at a discounted bulk rate. Uh, it also allows you to add more to your catalog and, you know, take on sales that you weren't able to from non-stocked items. There's a lot of great reasons around dropship. I would say though, uh, there's a lot of great, a lot of great reasons to implement wholesale as well. And in this current time, yes, for sure. <clears throat> All right, just reading through this one. Okay, that's more of a statement versus a question. Um, I'm a Amazon eBay seller. Should I start doing dropshipping? And can you recommend any good dropshipping channel? Um, dropshipping on Amazon and eBay. Dropshipping in general. It's all about your partner network. It's all about how much do you trust your, your partner. So we do recommend um, working with multiple drop shippers when you are drop shipping and you're not stocking in-house inventory at all, and at least not a ton of it, to have overlap in, that, in those products because we are seeing large distributors go out of business or at least stop taking in orders, I should say, um, while their, their competitors are not. They're not as big, they don't have as large grocery contracts, whatever it might be, and they still have the same product that you have listed on Amazon um, and, and you, know, you, you have access to. So you, you know, just like anything else, you gotta diversify like I was saying earlier, uh, but kind of adding layers, uh, multiple layers and points of failure there that you can kind of rely on um, is, is gonna be key there. So Amazon, eBay, I say that specifically with them because you have to be really careful about orders you cannot fulfill on either one of those platforms, especially Amazon. Um, you know, so dropshipping can be tough there and you need to be able to rely on your dropship partner to ship within the, that, you know, specific requirement that Amazon needs. All right, I'm gonna look for one more. I do have to drop um, and go to another meeting here in a minute. 
<clears throat> okay, so that was most of many ways. Um, I did have a request here uh, to share the, the screen again for the diagram on the different platforms, but I am going to send out, everyone's going to get a recording of the, um, of the webinar and you'll also get, uh, you know, we're going to put out a, a guide on this and kind of put it into more of a, a written format too. So you'll, you'll be getting that as well uh, at some point after the, after the follow up here. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it. I really appreciate it. This is probably our biggest webinar we've had. A lot of people stayed all the way through the end. I really am grateful for that. I mean, everyone's just sitting at the house anyways, might as well watch your 400th webinar you've been invited to. Um, so really appreciate it. Thanks again, guys. Um, yeah, I uh, hope to see you on the next one.